Sweet. Cool. Can you guys hear me? I. Cool. Thanks for coming to my talk. So today we're going to speak about a special bug that affects a lot of smart contracts. And there was over $1 billion at risk during its peak. And this bug was also awarded the world's largest bug bounty ever paid ever. So let's get into it. So just a bit about myself. I'm Ashik Amin. Um, I recently became independent a few months ago, but before that, I was working at IOSIDO for two years. That's where I learned about smart contracts. And I think some of the IOSIDO guys are around. So if they are, you should definitely speak to them. They're super duper talented and produce like the most amazing work. So shout out to IOSIDO. Um, in my spare time, I like to play CTFs and I play under the team name Toasted Steak Sandwich. The team is just me. I'm the whole team. But I don't play for points, so I just do it for learning, like just for fun. And when I do have anything like noteworthy, I will write about it on my blog. So at ashik.co.za, you can see all of my CTF blog posts. And there's also just social media handles if you guys ever want to get in touch. So Twitter is probably the best. Um, I don't really like Discord. Discord is full of spam, so I'll probably miss your message. But Twitter is pretty good. Um, Beyond that, I also post about my research. So a lot of my research is about bug bounties. So during my time at IOSIRO, I focused on bug disclosures and kind of posted all of the different bugs that I've disclosed over time. So today we'll be speaking about one of the bugs I disclosed and escalated as well. So cool. The bug is about breaking smart contracts and in particular it's breaking proxy contracts. But to get to it, I'm kind of going to build up all the requirements that we need to talk about a brick, right? So I'm going to intro smart contracts, intro the requirements that we need for the bug, speak about the exploit, speak about the impact, and then talk about escalation. And then right at the end, we can talk about impact and any of the remediation. Cool. So what are smart contracts? Man? So IBM says smart contracts are programs on the blockchain, and they run when predetermined conditions are met. But I mean, you can Google it, and you'll find 10,000 definitions. But basically, they are blockchain programs, right? But what does that mean? So Usually, people talk about smart contracts as analogous to vending machines. So the reason they use this analogy, right, is because vending machines don't have this idea of a cron, right? So on their own, vending machines don't do anything. So until someone comes up and puts some money in, selects an item, then there's some kind of output, right? So smart contracts sort of behave in the same way. There's no notion of cron job. So they won't act on themselves, right? There has to be some entity interacting with a contract before something happens. So it's usually some kind of external, either human being or even just a script that's running. More importantly, a smart contract has two very important things, and that's just code and state. So the code is compiled bytecode, um, but you can write it in any language. So Solidity, Viper, and there's a couple old ones too. But the state, yeah, so the state is the other part of it. And the state is basically the storage of the contract. And that's just holding all the state variables. So anything important related to like metadata or anything else, right? Cool. So because smart contracts live on a blockchain and not just on a server somewhere, it inherits a lot of properties. But the main three ones for today are irreversible transactions. So when you interact with any smart contract or anything on the blockchain, there's no way to reverse the transaction. So once it's done, it's finalized, right? So if you are an expert at blockchain, you will argue with me and say, that's not true because you can technically fork the chain and pay someone, pay all the miners to get it right. But like for today's purpose, it's not really true, right? So we can just call it irreversible. And then the next property is atomic transactions. And this just means that transactions happen as is. So it either happens all together or none at all, right? And this is very important. So if your code hits a revert at some point later in the stack, the entire thing goes, reverts back basically, and there's no state changes committed. So that just means that everything happens at once or none at all. And then the last property is immutable code. And this is the most important one for today. So immutable code just means that once you've deployed your bytecode, there's no way to change it, right? It's there forever and it's just never gonna change. You could hard code some parameters to pause your contracts, but there's no way to do anything else. Uh, there is a special edge case of immutability, and that's called self-destruct. 
So there is an instruction on the blockchain that you can use specifically for Ethereum and Ethereum style chains where you could wipe out all of the state and wipe out all of the code. So in that sense, it's not super immutable because it's either on or off. You can't edit the code. So, I mean, if you're a dev, which I think some of you guys are, you might be thinking like, what the hell? Who wants to write immutable code? That's like very scary, right? So this has been an issue. I mean, I tried to get this graph where I've tried to show that there's been $3 billion worth of damage that's already been taken place because of immutable code. But I couldn't get an exact estimate because there's also things like private key compromises and insider trading. So it might be higher. But the point is that it's a high number, like in the billions. Um, so there's a very real need for upgradability. But unfortunately, this is a double-edged sword because upgradability comes with its own issues that caused even more money to be lost. So to talk about upgradability and how it works, we have to first talk about how smart contracts communicate with each other at all. Right? And the first way is a dot call. So that call works in the same way you might think a normal computer, computer program works. And that's just by one contract calling another one and the state changes are committed to the, to the contract that we called. Right? Uh, pretty straightforward. So as the example in the slide, if you had a call transfer, the token balance on contract B state would be updated. The next call is a delegate call and this is basically what's called a code copy, right? So instead of the state changes committing on the initial contract, sorry, the target contract is committed on the initial contract, right? And what this means is the code at contract B is copied and those state changes are applied to contract A. So you can just think of delegate call as copy, right? And this two things we can use together and form some kind of mini architecture and this will be enough to have an upgradable pattern, right? So what we do is we separate the bytecode from the state by using two separate contracts respect one of the other, right? So we call the proxy contract the one that holds the state and the logic contract the ones that hold the bytecode. So if at some point we find some buggy issue in the logic contract, we can upgrade the logic contract by simply pointing to a new logic contract at the bottom of the slide. There's like a tiny diagram. Cool. So those are two ingredients that we have. We have upgradability and we have self-destructs. But the last ingredient that we need for our bug is just to talk about initialization. So when you deploy a smart contract, there's a constructor that runs, which is the normal function that you consider in a normal computer programming, in computer programs. But in this case, because the state and the logic are separate, we need to initialize the proxy contract separately. So we need to simulate a constructor to get the state across. So the way that works, we just hard code a special function and make sure it only runs once. And usually, just like a normal constructor, there's access control that happens that gets provided to different users when the initialization takes place. Cool. So this is the first iteration of the bug. And before we can talk about the diagram and how the ex actual exploit works, we need to just talk about the assumptions that we need to make. So in this case, we need to assume that our logic contract has some kind of delegate call, right? So just taking on that assumption, there's an exploit that we can do. So one is that we check if the logic contract has been initialized. Because if you remember, the state of the logic contract is not important in our architecture at all. So we can initialize the logic contract, get any of the access controls needed if it's been initialized, and then we can deploy our own contract because it's permissionless. Anyone's allowed to deploy contracts. And in this contract, we can include a self-destruct instruction. So what we could do is, using this delegate call that we assumed, we could upgrade the logic contract and destroy it. All right, so what does that look like? So once the delegate call is performed, our bytecode at our logic contract is wiped, the logic state is wiped. So this just means that the proxy points to nothing. And this is the first iteration of the brick. But this is just temporary, so it's only the first iteration. And the proxy administrator could come in and say, hey, I've seen the brick. It's kind of an issue, but no problem. We've included upgradability on purpose. So we can just go in and upgrade the proxy, point to a new logic, 
sort it out. Cool. So let's just chat about impact. Even though it's only a temporary brick, it's still pretty bad. So the logic contract is permanently destroyed. Right? Once it is destroyed, there's no way to get it back because transactions are irreversible, as we discussed. Um, the assets that are on the proxy itself, so if you have however much million dollars worth of tokens, those are not accessible at all while the proxy is picked. So until an administrator comes through and upgrades the contract, it's locked in. And this could also be made more severe if there's a time lock, right? Because we have to sort of trust admins to not just hot swap a logic at any time. So we act, sometimes there's a time lock involved where you have to commit a code for maybe seven days or 14 days, and people are allowed to check out what the code is doing before it's applied. So your assets might be locked up for a little while. And the next thing is a proxy knob. So when the proxy is damaged and just becoming a brick, there's no hard code that reverts, right? So the code just knobs through. And that just means that any calls to the proxy itself after a brick means that there's just nothing happening. So if access controls are relied on the proxy, then we just bypass those access controls. And this happened in RBV2, right? And then the last one is just reputational damage. Which isn't like a real big issue, but I mean, I wouldn't trust my money if someone's code got picked, right? Cool. So let's talk about profit. The first profit mechanism is exploiting the knob. So in RVV2, their contracts were vulnerable to this exact bug. And if it was exploited, it is possible to steal a couple million dollars out of a different contract because there was a knob through the access control. But it never happened though, because there was the, someone disclosed the responsibly, there was actually no exploit, so all good. The next way is uh, shorting the lock token. So if your contract has a bunch of native tokens, FTT token or any other token, you could short the token beforehand, exploit the contract, and then cause panic and you'll make a lot of money. This also has never happened before, but it is some way to make money. And then the best case is responsible disclosure, which is sort of what happens in each case with this bug, right? So for RVV2 in the example, the white hat got paid $25,000 for disclosing, which is not bad. It's a sort of on par with critical bugs of Web2, right? Cool. So we already spoke about the admin upgrading to a fresh logic contract, but if you're a bug bounty hunter, you could think, Cool. what are some of the things you could do to fix the bug if you find it? And one way is just to initialize the contact directly without using your malicious contact, right? So that just means we're gonna pick the contract as is, but not in a malicious way. And then petrifying the logic contract. So that just means as you deploy the contract, the constructor automatically initializes the logic so that no one else can reinitialize it. Okay, so we've done good. We made $25,000. We prevented a couple million from being stolen. Uh, the admins were annoyed, but they've upgraded their code, their code, but we can do a little bit better. So when I say a little bit better, there's a special branch of proxies where we can escalate the temporary brick to a permanent one. And that's the UUPS proxy. So how does it work? It's very similar to our original proxy, but with a couple differences and the main idea behind it is to highly optimize the proxy itself. And what that means is that the upgrade mechanism is moved from the proxy to the logic. So this just also means that the proxy itself has no right functions at all. So the only way to act with the state is through delegate, delegate call into the logic control. And everything else sort of works as is. The initialization provides access control as usual. Um, and then the main point of the UEPS proxy is that the upgrade itself has a delegate, which you'll see. So this is what the upgrade mechanism looks like. And there are only two main steps. One is to check that we have authorization to perform an upgrade. And the second one is to perform the upgrade itself, right? So authorized upgrade, once initialized, you get those controls to do it. Cool. Looking at the upgrade mechanism, we can see there's a delegate call, right? And this delegate call is allowed to run at any time provided you submit, send some data in. And this just means that anyone that upgrades can always perform a delegate call, right? And if you remember, this is performed on the logic contract. Cool. So the actual exploit for a permanent brick performs in the exact same way as the previous one. 
where if it's not initialized, you can initialize it with our own malicious contact and call a self-destruct. So everything looks the same. But the differences are in the way the actual impact works. So part of the impact is that the proxy now points to a logic that is permanently destroyed. And the proxy permanently points to nothing, which means there's no state changes that can ever be performed again. So any of your assets are gone forever, right? Cool. And updated impact. So one of the main things that's different is that the proxy itself points to nothing permanently. The similar impact is that the logic contract is permanently destroyed. And the third is that your assets are locked forever. So if you have a couple hundred million, that's gone forever. Uh, and then proxy knobs are working in the same way too. Cool. So when I was working at IOSIDO, I disclosed this bug to five uh, companies. Two of these are not mine, but two of them were also undisclosed. So I just hot swapped them with other pictures. On the top right hand side is from DW, and at the bottom is from Teller. And just on these five contracts alone, we managed to save over $15 million from being hacked. Right? And at the time, uh, I thought, cool, this is probably a bit more of a widespread issue. So I spoke to Kyle, who was my boss at the time, and we decided to escalate this issue a bit further. And we hosted a meeting with Open Zeppelin, which is the author of the UUPS proxy. And when I spoke to them, we just told them, hey, you know, look, we found these five contracts. It might be an issue. And they said, yeah, actually, someone came to us a couple of days earlier. They found the same issue and we've started the remediation process. And that process was them scraping every single blockchain and they found 150 other contracts that were vulnerable. Uh, so luckily they found it, right? But what did they do? They detected all of the contracts across different chains. They updated the source code to include a Petrify logic so that all of it is fixed in the future and they've monitored their solution. So basically, every time there's a new deployment, they will check whether or not they're vulnerable and just fix the vulnerability as is, right? So forever. So you might be thinking, cool, we're done. Right? Like everything's sorted out. There's just no more bugs. They've detected everything on every chain. The source code is updated. They've monitoring for new vulnerable contracts. Surely there's nothing else. And except there was just one more bug, right? There was one more and that affected Wormhole. So Wormhole was vulnerable to this exact bug in a slightly nuanced way, where an anonymous white hat found $700 million at risk. And just for their disclosure alone, they got paid $10 million. Um, I wasn't the white hat, they got the 10 million. If it was me, I wouldn't give this talk. I'd be on, <laughs> I would be on the beach somewhere or something. But yeah, cool. Cool. So that's it for me. The last couple takeaways is just that um, part of the reason this bug slipped through everyone was that it wasn't a code level bug. So all the top auditing firms, Trail of Bits, Open Zeppelin, everyone missed this bug because it is a state dependent bug. Right? And what this means is everyone was sort of looking one way and no one was looking the other way. So if anyone's interested, you should 100% start learning how smart contracts work. And I'm sure you could find some of your own bugs. Cool. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Oh, happy to take any questions too. Hundred percent. So there's a bunch of different online materials. I can send you a list personally, but I've mainly focused on trading from the security side. So there's some war games where you can learn about Solidity and you can learn about how vulnerabilities work on Solidity. And plenty of CTFs for sure. So CTFs can definitely help you upscale and find these bugs for yourself.
Cool. So the question was, is there any way we could find these bugs automatically and always remediate them as is like, to prevent them? Yeah. yeah. So not right now, not that I know of any. The idea is mostly grassroots. So as bugs are discovered, they usually come out with blog posts and just talk about how the bug was discovered, how to remediate it, what to do next. And unfortunately, most people don't like to disclose their bugs too. Right? We, I've worked with people and they've asked me very specifically to not publish a certain bug that I'm sure affected another contract. So there's no real easy way, unfortunately, but hopefully like with incentivizing like $10 million worth of bugs, I'm sure it'll come out. So yeah, not at this stage. Yeah, I mean, I think the nice thing about bug bounties is that you can just drop most of your assumptions about any kind of library or any contract, right? So if you think this one thing is secure, it's it might not be, right? I mean, Wormhole had 700 million and looking at Wormhole on its own, I might think, cool, 700 million is quite a lot of money. I'm sure it's safe, but they got hacked three times for 300 million in a different case. <laughs> so you can start anywhere you want, really. And I think the main thing is just to do some upskilling in the beginning for genetics. And once you're comfortable with that, 100%, you can just go whatever you feel comfortable with. Mind explaining zero trust? Absolutely. I mean, the main thing is that different functions have different access levels, right? Different access controls. You don't want anyone being able to upgrade a contract or break your contract, right? So you can definitely bake in access control for certain addresses, for certain accounts. But not everyone does this, and that's why they get hacked. And that's why this $3 billion is gone. But uh, yeah, I mean, the code is quite genetic, so it's quite granular in the sense that you can hard code any kind of access control that you want and prevent certain messages and prevent certain calls or delegate calls or any kind of message you want. But you'd have to hard code that in depending on your needs. Yeah. Cool. Thanks guys.